Here we go. Take this out of here. Oh yeah, wonderful. In this video, we're doing head gaskets on a 5.4 liter Triton V8. And I wanna share with you not only the procedure, but also some tips and tricks on how to do this job. This is a long one, so grab some popcorn and a drink and let's get started. All right, so let's disconnect the battery, remove the terminal, and remove the battery completely if you want to. Drain the cooling system. I guess you don't technically have to drain it, but you're gonna make less of a mess if you do. And then we have to get this plastic cover out of the way. So remove the spare tire tool and then all of the push clips that go along with holding this down and get that out of the way. I also wanna work my way from top to bottom at this point and remove the air intake. That's gonna be the first thing that's in my way other than this engine cover. And once that's off, we can pull off anything that's attached to it, such as hoses, hose clamps that attach it to the throttle body and get this out of your way. Continuing with the upper radiator hose, get this off the radiator because we need to get the fan shroud out of the way at this point. And uh, on the other side is gonna be another hose. Pliers are gonna be your best friend at this point because you're gonna need them a lot. These transmission lines, the uh, ones that go into the radiator to cool down the transmission fluid, they require a special type of tool to get them out of here. As you can see, this is what I'm using. It kind of sticks in there, spreads out a couple clips that are inside that you can't see. And once you press the tool in, you should be able to pop the line right out just like this. If you don't have that tool, you're going to need it. There is no other way to remove the lines from the fittings. Now let's break the fan clutch free from the water pump for which you will need a special fan clutch tool. You might be able to do it without it if you have a large enough wrench and a hammer, but typically you need that tool. And with that out of there, the fan and the fan shroud come out as one assembly. So get those out of there, but make sure you don't rip any wires or hoses as you take that out. Next, with the belt still attached, break free the water pump pulley bolts because otherwise it will be a lot more difficult. It'll just want to spin on you. Take the serpentine belt off, use a half inch breaker bar on the tensioner and release tension. That way you can remove the belt and just take it out of the way completely. Obviously, we don't need it to stay on at this point. Take the idler pulley off and then we're gonna take the tensioner off as well. We want to remove as much stuff out of our way as possible. It just takes three bolts and the tensioner is out. Now we can completely remove the water pump pulley. Typically these are gonna be seized on there. So grab a rubber mallet and kind of give it a couple taps to break it free. Now this is not necessary, but it is highly recommended and that is replacing your water pump. I'm removing it and reinstalling a new one. I'm going through this whole procedure. I might as well replace the water pump. It is just a small component at this point. So this one is also kind of stuck on here and I'll show you in a second why, because there's a lot of corrosion built up around the edge there where it kind of seals together with the block. So using a rubber mallet will ensure that I don't damage anything, but I still create enough vibrations to break it free. And once it pops free, take that last bolt out. And as you can see, that is severe corrosion in there. And it's a good thing I'm getting a new water pump because that wasn't gonna last too much longer. Get the power steering pulley off. And for that, you'll need this special tool that pulls it off. You could just unbolt the pump and set it aside, but I had the tool, so I just pulled the pulley off. And then the harmonic balancer, you have to use a special puller to remove that once you remove the main crank bolt. And uh, there you go. That's all the pulleys that you need to take out. Let's go back up top and remove the upper radiator hose off of the thermostat housing, pull that out of the way completely. And then we need to get the throttle body off and that means taking the throttle cables off. If you have cruise control, you're gonna have two of them. If not, just one. Take that bracket out of the way and then remove this coolant hose that goes on the intake and the other one. I'm gonna get the alternator out of my way as well. So I remove the main power wire. I like to put the mounting nut back on there just so I don't lose it because it's small take out the two connections as well that connect the alternator to everything else and then unbolt it from the top and from the bottom. It just has four bolts that hold the whole thing on. It's very easy to remove and get that out of the way. Take the power steering pump reservoir bracket off and set that aside. You need to unbolt it and we'll come back to that in a minute. But for now, let's unbolt some more electrical connectors and wires as well as some vacuum hoses that are up top. There's gonna be a lot of vacuum hoses here. Ford love to put a bunch of vacuum actuated things. So just be careful with them. Don't break any of them and pay attention to how they're routed. Take the PCV out of the passenger side valve cover. I had a lot of things rigged up here. The previous owner just pieced things together to make it work. And it worked, but it wasn't great. 
now we can unbolt the throttle body. It just has four bolts that hold it on and you're definitely gonna need a swivel to get to those rear ones. But before that happens, we need to get the EGR off. And to do that, we have to unbolt this bracket that holds the pressure sensor on, the EGR pressure, pressure sensor. And then finally, we can unbolt the EGR. Now, here's a tip. My bolt here refused to come out and I didn't want to break it. So I worked it back and forth and I sprayed it with a lot of rust penetrant. I even heated it a tiny bit, but you have to be careful because the throttle body is aluminum and you don't want to damage it. If you damage it, you're gonna have to get a new one, unfortunately. Um, now I was able to save the threads, save the bolt and just pull the throttle body off, thankfully. So that worked out for me. Next, let's unplug all of the injectors as well as the ignition coils on both sides. Just work your way down the line because we're gonna have to pull the intake off and all of those have to come apart to do so. There's a couple other wiring harnesses and connectors in the way. So just pull that out of the way and uh, then unbolt the ignition coils. They just screw onto the intake. And once you pull those off, we'll be ready to unbolt the intake and get it out of our way. Like I said, do this to both sides. The driver's side is gonna be a little bit more cluttered just because of the EGR, the power steering pump reservoir, and a couple other hoses that are in the way. We also have to disconnect the fuel lines for which you also need a special tool for. And if you don't have it, well, you won't be able to disconnect the fuel lines. It basically, just like the transmission lines, sticks itself in there, and watch out for spraying fuel, and uh, then unclamps the line basically. Now, remove all of the intake bolts that hold it onto the engine block. Start from the outside and work your way towards the inside so that you don't warp anything and or crack the intake. It is plastic, so you wanna be careful. This is the proper sequence of unbolting it. Start from the outer ends and then work your way towards the middle, just like I'm doing here. And once you remove all of the bolts, which are pretty tight and be careful not to break them, you can remove the intake right out of your way with the fuel rail and everything. Now I'm gonna move this wiring harness just a little out of my way so that I can get a little bit more space Let's move down a little bit and take the exhaust manifolds out. Yes, you have to take those off, unfortunately, but it's not as bad as you think, and you might as well replace them at this point. Unbolt the pipe from the manifold, which is gonna be the easier part, because, well, yeah, this happens, and it happens often. Fortunately for me, I only broke one stud, and I was able to extract it from the head, but just unbolt all the studs. Typically, the nuts, well, oh, get the floppy hair out of there, I can't see, there we go. So typically the studs will come out with the nuts. The nuts will be kind of rusted to the studs, but that's okay as long as they come out. Take the transmission dipstick tube off, and then we're gonna wanna unbolt the power steering pump reservoir off of the block with the whole bracket. So try to get a socket in there. It's gonna be pretty difficult, I'm not gonna lie, but it's doable. And once you get that unbolted, you don't have to remove the bolts completely, unlike what I thought and to get more access to it, I'm just gonna unbolt the oil dipstick tube as well. So I can move that out of the way as I pull this bracket up. So take the power steering pump reservoir out, which I will not be disconnecting. And as you can see, the bracket comes right out. Now we can unbolt the valve covers. It just has a lot of eight millimeter bolts all the way around. So there's no sequence, just work your way around and remove all of them, break them free first. Some of them will be a little trickier to get to, especially the ones at the back of the engine where you have the brake booster on the driver's side, but it's doable. Pull up on the valve cover, peel the gasket out of there, and then move to the passenger side where you can do the same exact thing take out all of the eight millimeter bolts and studs that hold this on and then pull this valve cover out of the way. This one will be pretty tricky because at the back, the head and the camshaft will have a large hump that you have to clear. And it's very tight there because you're right up against the firewall. Now for this, what I found to be very useful is if you take that valve cover and you spin the front of it towards the water pump area, towards the valley of the engine, the back will basically unlodge itself and somehow you will be able to pull it up. And with all of that off, let's get the timing cover off. So remove all of the surrounding bolts and obviously it's not just gonna come out of there. There are several sizes of bolts all the way around, including those massive 24 millimeters at the bottom, which are actually studs. So don't forget about those. There isn't a sequence for doing this. You just go around and get all of them off. And don't forget about the ones underneath. There are four that hold the oil pan onto the timing cover. And then this one little sneaky one that bolts on the power steering pump to the timing cover, which I didn't even know about because mine was so gunked up with debris that I didn't see it. Also, don't forget to unplug your crankshaft position sensor. You can leave it bolted on, but unplug it because the wiring harness obviously won't come with it. Now take a pry bar and very gently pry the timing cover off. It has a couple dowel pins that'll get stuck on. And once that breaks free, you can take it right off. 
take the crank trigger wheel off and then put the crank bolt in so that we can spin the engine over and line it up at top dead center. Top dead center for this engine will be the crankshaft at approximately 12 o'clock. The passenger side cam needs to be at about 11 o'clock and the driver side cam needs to be at 12 o'clock. They won't line up perfectly, but just get them close. Now I highly recommend removing the spark plugs because one, you're taking the heads off anyway, so you might as well just take them out now. That way you don't fight compression as you spin the engine over. And number two, you can inspect them, not just the condition of the plugs, but also how tight they are because these tend to blow out and I actually had one that was loose and it was ready to blow out. So just keep that in mind. This is the spark plug that I pulled out of the cylinder with the blown head gasket and you can see how many deposits there were on it. Now let's spin the engine over and line it up at top dead center on cylinder one, which is gonna be the first one on the passenger side. Spin it clockwise and now unbolt the tensioner. What I actually was supposed to do is hold the cam. All it takes is a 3 8 drive ratchet or breaker bar, and that's it. You just have to hold it in place. You stick it in the end there. Otherwise, it'll fly backwards, and thankfully, I didn't have any damage occur, but I could have. That could have been bad. So as you can see, I learned my lesson on the driver's side, and I was holding the cam as I removed the tensioner, and guess what? It worked. So take the guides off, unbolt the other ones. I actually had a broken guide, so my passenger side non-tensioning guide was already out of there. And that's all it takes to remove the timing chains. Now onto the heads, let's work away from the outside towards the inside. You want to do that sequence so that you don't warp anything. Use a breaker bar, don't use power tools, and just pay attention to the noises it makes. And actually watch what happens when I crack this first bolt free. Do you see that? Let's look at that again. The cam actually skipped and moved just from me cracking that bolt loose. And you know what that is? That is how little movement it takes to spin the cam lobe under pressure. So cracking that bolt free made the springs put pressure on the cam lobe and turned it. So just pay attention. The cracking that you hear is normal. It's the bolts being so tight in there that they're breaking free from the threads. And that's why you wanna slowly crack them free first, not just remove them all the way. You wanna give them time to break free and do it gently. Now that they're completely unbolted, I can run them out with my air impact, but I'm not actually impacting them out of there. I'm just unthreading them quickly. So you can use that, that's safe. Just don't use that when you first break them free. Remove all the bolts. And once you have all of them out, there should be 10 of them. Take this out of here. Oh yeah, wonderful. And yeah, it makes a mess. And that is exactly where it was blown. As you can see, it's missing the gasket material there. And now we'll do the same thing to the passenger side. I'll give you a listen to the wonderful creaky noises that the bolts make. And uh, it's a little scary to be honest, if you're not used to it. Now after you've loosened them completely, just run them out with whatever tool you have just so it can go faster. Remove all the bolts. And there's a trick on this side because one of the bolts will hit one of your AC components here. And the manual will say, remove your AC or remove the engine. You don't have to do either of those. Here's what I did. As you can see, I pulled it out partially and then I tied a wire tie around it high enough to clear the engine block, but low enough to clear the AC lines and everything else that's in the way. And with that in place, I just realized that I didn't unbolt the crossover tube for the coolant off the back of the head and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't moving, but that's okay. Unbolt it really quick and now the head should come right out. The wiring harness is gonna get in your way on this side because there's very little room to push it, but just work with it. And try not to do what I just did here. As you can see, I put the head right on the block and that most likely could have damaged it. Thankfully didn't, but it could have. Here we go. 
Here's how I remove that broken exhaust stud. I just pull up some weld in there. This is an aluminum head, so it won't weld to the head. And then weld a nut on top of that weld and then just grab it with a wrench and break it free. And after a couple turns back and forth, it comes right out and there you have it. And now I had to do the same thing to this stud that was actually stuck in there. It wasn't broken, it was just stuck. And I couldn't get anything else to break it free, so I just welded a knot onto it. The heat breaks it free, and then you just grab it with some pliers because it's really hot, and then take it out. Before you send the heads to the machine shop, which is highly recommended, remove any sensors that are in the heads, any extra studs, bolts, uh, wires, anything, as well as these dowel pins, because the machine shop will pull them out, you just might not get them back. So just as a side note, keep them safe, pull them out, and uh, they're very important for reinstallation. Now while the heads are at the machine shop, let's clean up the engine block itself, the surface where the head goes and the head gasket. You wanna take a razor blade and scrape off any debris to start with. You wanna get the majority of the gunk off before you go in a more fine cleaning and a razor blade will do that very well because this is a cast iron block and a razor blade is much softer than the cast iron block. So you have very, very little chances of damaging anything. Use some brake parts cleaner and just degrease everything. Don't worry about anything that goes into the cylinders or down into the coolant or oil ports. We can take care of that later and it's not going to damage anything. Optionally, only if you have a sanding block, you can take some fine grit sandpaper, sand down the surface of the block, and use some brake parts cleaner to prevent the sandpaper from clogging up. And I say this because if you don't have a good sanding block, don't just use a piece of wood because it might not be flat and you might actually warp or damage the surface. Only use a sanding block, a good quality one that you know is flat with good sandpaper. If not, don't even do this step, just skip it. It will be just fine without it. Now, if you have compressed air, you wanna blow out the holes where the bolts, the head bolts go in, because as you can see, a lot of oil just came out of there and you don't want to leave that in there. You don't want any liquid in those holes. Any liquid at all, as you put the bolt through and start threading it in, it will hydro lock in there. It will compress so much that it will crack the engine block because the, the fluid can't compress. So what I'm doing here is I'm spraying brake parts cleaner in there to remove all oils and contaminants and the brake cleaner will dissolve it and then I will blow them out again, spraying all that brake cleaner out and that will basically completely clean out the holes and then I'll have very clean threads to work with. And then you wanna also blow out around the pistons just so that anything that got into those piston rings can unlodge itself and just get out of there. You don't want any debris stuck in there. And uh, you can also clean up the pistons, which I did, but you don't really have to, this is optional. And because my head was at the machine shop for about a week, I did not want any rust building up on the cylinder walls, on the block surface. So what I did is I coated all of these surfaces in engine oil. Obviously, we're gonna have to clean it all up again when the head comes back from the machine shop, but this is a great way to protect that surface because if you don't, you will get flash rust. Any moisture, condensation, anything that builds up on there will rust. This is bare metal. As you can see, I'm cleaning up the pistons. Like I said, this is completely optional. You don't have to do this. I just did it because I wanted it to look pretty. That's basically, to be honest, my only, uh, my only reason. You don't have to do this whatsoever. And uh, if you have, a, actually, if you have a really badly blown head gasket and coolant is being burnt in that cylinder, this is what your piston will look like compared to the dirty one. So you'll have a very clean cylinder and that's because the coolant will get in there and as it's burning, it will clean up all of that carbon buildup, all of the gunk and debris that's stuck to the piston. So that's how you know that you are actually burning coolant. Now I wasn't, it was starting to, but it wasn't actually bad. So if you're gonna do this, just do it across all of them. That way they're all even. Make sure you blow everything out so you don't get debris stuck in there. And now with the heads back from the machine shop, let's put back all of the sensors that we removed. For me, it was actually just this coolant temp sensor. So make sure it's nice and snug and I put some Teflon tape on there to make sure it seals up. As you can see, this is a nice clean surface. However, look at what comes off on my rag when I clean it up with brake parts cleaner because the machine shop will coat the surface so it doesn't corrode. So clean it up, clean up the block side because as you remember, I put engine oil on it and you want that completely off of there. 
So use some brake parts cleaner and clean it off, blow out everything again. And then before installation, I like to give these some time to sit. So I'm gonna do this now. I'm gonna coat the head bolts in engine oil. You want brand new head bolts, okay? You don't wanna reuse them because the old ones stretch. They stretch as you tighten them. So coat them all in engine oil. I put actually, I'm gonna be honest, way too much engine oil on them, but it's a good thing because I let them sit for about 10 to 15 minutes before I put them in. So all of the oil fell off of them. Put the head gasket on and they are directional. The driver's side will be a slightly different than the passenger side. And then uh, you can put the head right on and the dowel pins that we removed earlier, I put them back. They will hold that head in place until you start threading on the head bolts. As you can see, I'm putting them down now and starting them on a couple threads just so it can hold that head in place and I'm assured that it won't fall off on me because if it does, it can start damaging things. So put all of the head bolts in, the sequence for putting them in doesn't matter, it's just the tightening sequence that matters, which here it is, right here on the screen, you can see that you start from the center and work your way towards the outer bolts, which is the exact opposite of how we removed it. And that is because removal is reverse of installation and vice versa. Now we can finally torque the head down. And there are three passes in the same sequence, but you'll notice that I actually did four passes. And that is because my first two passes are the same. They are at the same torque, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure I note the torque on the screen here, but what I did is I went over it twice because this is going to be your base torque. This is the only time that you're torquing it to a specific foot-pound tightness, basically. All the other passes are going to be degrees, and if you don't have your base torque right, your degrees are going to be off. Now, yes, you might get your 90 degrees correctly, but the 90 degrees won't result in the same tightness as it would if your base torque was correct. So that's what I was going for here. I wanted to make sure that they are all exactly tightened as they should be, so I did. I went over it twice, and now I'm going 90 degrees on my first pass, and then we'll have a second pass at 90 degrees. So I'll give you a listen here to the live audio because to be honest, at times it got a little scary because of the creaking of the bolts, which should be eliminated by the oil on them to lubricate those threads because this is a wet torque, not a dry torque. But it still happens and it will always happen no matter what. It's just the nature of how tight these bolts have to be. One tip I have for you here is if you don't have a torque wrench that reads degrees, which I did, you want to mark your bolts with a, with a paint marker or anything to basically look at how much you've turned it because you can eyeball 90 degrees. It's going to be okay, but you want to make sure that you don't go way under or way over because then that's bad. So just mark the bolts. I've done that in the past and just use a breaker bar. My torque wrench reads degrees, however, on these bolts that it was creaking and skipping on, it actually didn't read anything. Every time it skipped, it would tighten, but the torque wrench didn't read a single degree. So I ended up having to basically eyeball the uh, tightness of these bolts. Basically judge how much the torque wrench spun in relation to the original positioning of the bolt. So I wish I marked them but I didn't because I thought the torque wrench would do the job for me and it didn't, it failed me. So I had to basically step in and figure out, okay, how much did I turn this torque wrench? Did I go 90 degrees? Did I only go 45, 30? And just do my best to tighten these bolts down to spec. Now, if you are a couple foot pounds off, 10 even, it's not going to be the end of the world. These are torque to yield bolts. So there is a point where, That's it. yes, they will be a little tighter than the other ones, but they do stretch. That's why you replace them. That's why they are torque to yield bolts. So you have a little bit of wiggle room in there, okay? It's not going to be the end of the world if you went like five or 10 degrees over or under, it's going to be fine. Just get it as close as you possibly can. And once you've done this procedure on the driver's side or on whichever side you're doing it first, um, and now that your muscles are very tired because this is actually pretty difficult, well, guess what? You get to do it again on the other side because you have no choice.
All right, that one didn't beat, but that's 90. Second pass complete. The head is torqued. All right, we're back to the passenger side. So let's put the head gasket on, just like we did on the driver's side. Plop the head over. Be very careful not to damage the surface. This one will be a little bit trickier just because of the limited amount of space you have there. Drop the head bolts in and make sure they're properly oiled. Don't put too much oil like I did. Just coat them lightly. Let them sit for a few minutes so that the oil, the excess oil can drain off. And then once you have all of these bolts started, which by the way, that tricky one, I did the same exact trick. I tied a wire tie around it, made sure it wasn't too high or too low for the head. And then I just put the head in with the bolt already in the head. And again, don't forget to cut that zip tie off. Obviously you want, you want that bolt to seat down all the way into the threads. And once you have that done, sequence is exactly the same. Three passes, I again chose to do four, and uh, just go ahead and torque it all down to spec. Like I said, first pass, I chose to repeat because of that base torque situation where I wanted to ensure that they were all the same. And uh, it's a good thing I did because on both heads, the center bolts that I started took another about an eighth of a turn to get back to their initial torque. So even though I torqued them at first, look at how much more movement they are getting on the same torque at a second pass. So just keep that in mind. Again, I'll let you listen to some live audio of the torquing happening because if you haven't done this before and you hear it for the first time live, you might get a little stressed out. It might be a little nerve wracking, but just I'm assuring you it's normal. And I think no matter how many times you do it, it's not going to be relaxing regardless. So enjoy. And second pass at 90 now. That's all of them. They're torqued and they are all set. All right, now it's time to put the timing chains on. And to do this, you'll see that it has a different colored link on the bottom. That needs to line up with this divot in the crank sprocket. And then at the top, it'll have two colored links that need to line up with the little tab or the mark on the camshaft. That's how you line them up. Those are the only timing marks you have on the chains. So it's actually pretty simple to do this. On the driver's side, which is the first chain that you have to put in, I made a mistake and I put the top guide in before the chain. So I torqued down this bottom one, which does go in first, but now I'm putting on this top one, which by the way, for the driver's side, it has that little hump that I just pointed out. The one that doesn't have the hump goes on the passenger side. But I highly suggest not putting this guide on with the tensioner yet because what happens is it doesn't give you enough room to freely put the chain in there. 
and I had to actually maneuver things out of the way and even remove that uh, guide to get my chain in there. So I highly recommend not doing it the way I did. It's still doable, but it's more difficult. Anyway, let's line up the chain with the little dimple, the notch on the crank sprocket. You can use a mirror to double check your work unless you're going to look from underneath, but otherwise you can't hold the chain. And as you can see right here in my mirror, it is spot on. You can see the little dimple, you can see the gold link, which by the way, they're not always gold. I've seen them blue or other colors. So it de depends on the brand of chain that you buy. Now use that 3 8 drive breaker bar or ratchet, whatever you have, preferably a breaker bar because it won't spin in either direction. You can hold it and you can keep that cam steady. And you can line up those two gold links with the little mark on the cam sprocket and that's it. That's, you know you're timed at this point. And as you can see, I actually had to remove my guide because like I mentioned earlier, it won't give you enough space. So put the guide on last as well as the tensioner. Here I had to kind of fight the pressure a little bit because everything was situated in place. So this is my bad, but here you can learn from my mistake. Make sure the chain is situated on every guide that it needs to be in and then move to the passenger side, torque the top guide. And on this side, you can actually put the lower guide on because it can fall backwards um, just like this right here, you can see I'll let it lay backwards a little bit so that it can give me the space I need. On the driver's side, it wants to fall down into the timing chain and that's why it doesn't work. So now put the passenger side timing chain on, double check it with a mirror. Yep, it's spot on just like you see here. Lay it down over the cam, grab your 3 8 breaker bar and move the cam if needed. Obviously it most likely will be, mine was quite a bit off. And once you get that top lined up, the two notch, the two links with the notch on the cam, you can let go and the chain will actually hold the tension on the cam. This passenger side cam has quite a bit more tension than the driver's side. So just be careful that the timing chain doesn't skip around. Now you can put the tensioner in. This side will be a little bit easier, but you still have to kind of fight the pressure a little bit. Snug them up. Torque everything down, okay? You wanna to torque all of these timing components down because you don't want this coming loose on you. And now, one thing I always do when I do anything timing related is I spin the engine over by hand because I want to make sure that everything moves freely. If anything binds up as you spin it, you know you are not timed correctly and you will get severe engine damage if you start it like this. So always spin it by hand. In this case, it's clockwise and I'm going several rotations. Now, here's a, a little note. I will not get the links to line up again with the timing marks, but I wanna make sure that after several revolutions, the timing marks do line up to where they're supposed to be. So approximately 12 o'clock on the crank, basically 11 to 12-ish, and then 11 o'clock on the passenger side with 12 o'clock on the driver's side. They're not gonna be perfect, but as long as they are in the vicinity of those numbers and you know that your links were lined up correctly, you're good to go. Okay, moving along to the timing cover, which is going to be our next step here. I wanna clean it all up and reseal it, put new gaskets on it, scrape off any of the old RTV that was on there because you wanna put new stuff on and I'm gonna show you exactly where to put it on. Regardless, a razor blade is gonna be the best thing to clean this up because it's a flat surface that won't damage the timing cover, which is aluminum, by the way. Another recommendation is to put a new front main seal or crank seal on because you're here, you might as well, this is going to be much easier than having to do it in the car later. So even if yours is good, put a new one on, clean up that surface like I do here. You don't have to use emery cloth or sandpaper or anything. I just did because there was some corrosion built up on there, but basically just clean it up and then install the seal. You'll notice that I put a little bit of RTV on there and that's because I want it to help it seal up completely. Make sure that you seat it down flush with the timing cover. You don't want it to be recessed in or out. Completely flush is what you want. And when you hammer it, make sure you hammer on the outside. Now let's put the timing cover gaskets on. They are just some rubber gaskets that are formed around the, uh, the, the groove on the outside of it. So you basically can't not put them on correctly because they are formed to those specific grooves. So just follow the path and press them in. Now here on the engine block, you see where the head meets the block. We actually have to put some RTV on there and don't put a lot, just a little dab, just like I did here. That's what's gonna help seal the two areas together 
as well as down on the oil pan where the oil pan meets the block and the timing cover. There will be cracks where the oil will seep through if you don't put that on. And don't forget to put the crankshaft trigger wheel back on because otherwise your engine will not start. There will be no signal for the crank sensor to pick up. Install the timing cover. I tapped it on with a rubber mallet just to help it along. And then I used uh, my impact on the lowest possible setting here. You don't wanna crack the timing cover, but I used that to basically suck it onto the engine and make sure that it's sealed up nice and tight. And of course, I'm gonna to torque it down in the proper sequence to the proper spec, which I'll show you on the screen here. But it is important because this will seal up any oil leaks that might be there. And don't forget about the bolt that goes through the power steering pump and the ones at the bottom, which get tightened down and torqued to spec. And of course, don't forget to plug in your crankshaft position sensor or your vehicle won't start. Now put the harmonic balancer back, inspect it to make sure it's still in good condition. And if it is, go ahead and press it on with this special tool that you'll need. Do not suck it in with the bolt, okay? Don't press it in with that because you will damage the threads on the crankshaft and then you'll need a crankshaft. Also put some RTV on the bolt. I recommend doing that to seal it all up completely and then bottom it out and torque it. Now it does have a torque, but that is only for new bolts. I'm not using a new bolt, so I'm just making it nice and tight press on your power steering pump pulley if you took it off. If you just unbolted the pump, then just bolt the pump back on. But whatever you did, put it back. Now let's put the valve cover gaskets on and it only makes sense to replace them obviously, so that's why I'm putting new ones on. And you wanna put some RTV right where the timing cover meets the head. Those are two more areas on each side that are going to leak if you don't put that on because there's a tiny little air gap there that you don't see, but it's there, and you wanna seal it up. Now put the valve cover on and bolt it down. I'm just gonna run the studs and the bolts down with my air ratchet before I torque them down to spec. And the sequence for this is starting in the center, working your way out. And again, we're gonna do the same to the passenger side, which will be the trickier side. But as you can see, I think I figured out the right movement to get that valve cover on nice and quick. Otherwise, you'll struggle there for a while and just make sure your valve cover gasket doesn't fall off as you struggle to put that over that hump in the rear. Now I'm gonna put the spark plugs back. I'm using new spark plugs, I'm not reusing the old ones, and I'm torquing them all down to spec, which is important because like I mentioned before, these tend to blow out. Put new intake gaskets on, it's important. Bolt it down, we'll torque this to spec too, but I'm gonna run the bolts down first. The sequence will be working from the inside towards the outside, center out. Put the throttle body back on and make sure that it is bolted down nice and snug. Now there is a torque for this, but there's no way you're gonna get a torque wrench in there for all the bolts. So just snug them down nice and tight. The PCV valve issue. So I ended up getting a new PCV system, uh, the valve, the hoses and everything because the old one was bad and it was just a mess. So it's actually a very simple setup. But basically, if you have this cooled PCV system, which has coolant running through it, you have this hose right here that goes to the throttle body, which is just vacuum. And then you have a hose that runs to the back of the intake. You have the two coolant hoses that go in and out of the PCV valve. And then you have the hose right here that goes on the throttle body that then bolts to the front of the intake. So let's put back all of the hoses that go on the front of the intake, snug them all down with hose clamps or however they get attached. And let's not forget to put the fuel lines back on, which they just basically clip on. You don't need any tools in there. You just take the line and you slide it on until it clicks. Now let's plug in all of the injectors. We'll do this to both sides. And then I'm gonna drop in the ignition coils. And once they're all in, I'm gonna plug them all in, make sure the connections click so you don't get any misfires. Make sure you snug them down with the screws that bolt them on to the intake. They just screw into plastic. Do the same to both sides, of course. Let's put this power steering pump reservoir bracket back on with the two bolts that are a little tricky to reach, but with a swivel, totally doable. And just do your best to get these as tight as you can. Obviously don't over tighten them. Let's put the oil dipstick tube back onto the head, attach that, and then it's time for the exhaust manifolds. So I cleaned up the surface of the head there, as you can see where it bolts on. I have a new manifold, new hardware, 
And the sequence for this is starting from the back, working towards the front. That is the sequence you want to follow to completely seat and seal this manifold. And then once you have those studs and nuts tightened, go to the pipe. And there is actually no gasket that goes in here. So you might think that there's a donut gasket. There isn't one. It just seals by crushing the pipe onto the manifold. However, what I found is on these older pipes, because they're already rusted and pitted, it's not going to seal. So what you can do to help this along is add some exhaust gasket maker on there and that'll seal up the space for you. I tried that and it worked. Put back the transmission dipstick tube and make sure that it is nice and tight and secured onto the engine block. And now it's time for the EGR. I have a new one because my old one was rotted and it was just not functioning anymore. So put back the two mounting studs that hold it on. Make sure you have a new gasket in between there and make these nice and snug onto the throttle body. And let's thread it onto the driver's side manifold it just uses a large fitting and I used an adjustable wrench and snugged it down nice and tight and it worked just fine. Now let's go back up top and reattach the power steering reservoir onto this bracket that we just bolted on earlier. Make sure that it is nice and secure with all three mounting bolts and then put this triangulated looking bracket back on, attach it to the other bracket and then attach it to the intake here so it can all be secured together. Next, I'm gonna put on yet another bracket, which holds the EGR pressure sensor and uh, this other solenoid here, which has a couple vacuum hoses going to it. Reattach the EGR vacuum hoses and make sure that everything is nice and seated in there. And then of course, we're gonna bolt this down. There's one screw that goes into the intake and one that holds it onto the EGR stud. And that's it, plug in the electrical connections. Now let's move on to the throttle body area to put the throttle cables back on put this bracket in, snug it down, and the mistake I made was to completely tighten it before putting the throttle cables on. Not only does it make this a little bit more difficult to reattach these, as you can see, I kind of struggled with this one because I didn't have enough reach in it. And the other reason is, well, this needs to be properly adjusted. Otherwise, you will have an under or over adjusted throttle cable. So as you can see right here, my throttle cable was actually pulling the throttle open just a little bit. You can see how it can kind of close a little bit when I press it, and that's not good. And what I did to fix this is I loosened up all three bolts, and then I pushed the throttle cable in. Look at how much the throttle blade moved inwards when I pulled on the cable and loosened up the slack. So what that means is I would have gotten a high idle if I didn't fix that, which is not ideal. Next, let's put the alternator back in, tighten up the two bottom bolts, and I like to do this first so that I can press it up against the engine block completely before I mount the top two bolts because it's more important for it to be lined up with the other pulleys. So once you have that done, inspect your main power wire, make sure it's nice and clean and free of corrosion. If it is just like mine, go ahead and bolt it on there, and then put the other two electrical connectors in, make sure that they click into place. Now it's time for the serpentine belt tensioner. And once you have those three bolts in and tightened, we'll go ahead and put the idler in and tighten that one up as well. Torque them all down to spec so that you make sure that everything is good, as well as the idler, of course. And then we can put the water pump on. Now, again, you don't have to, but I highly recommend it. And the way I clean this up is, obviously there are multiple ways of doing this, but I just put a wire brush on my die grinder and the wire brush basically cleaned up everything in there nicely without digging into the surface too much. So I know that the surface is clean and the water pump will seal up. So slide the new water pump in. I have a couple bolts ready to go so that I can press it on once um, I get it started. So tighten them all up. And of course, we'll torque them to spec so that we make sure everything is properly tightened. Put the pulley on, which will drive the water pump off of the serpentine belt and tighten this up as well. And a little tip to torquing this is to stick a screwdriver or a pry bar between the head of the bolts and the center and hold it as you tighten it down. Now let's put on the upper radiator hose on the thermostat housing here, put the clamp back on to seal it up, and we'll put the serpentine belt on, which here's the diagram on the screen if you're interested. Just make sure you route it properly and correctly. I highly recommend a new serpentine belt unless you've recently replaced it because it only makes sense. And this is what happens when you get a new belt. It wants to fall off because it's not molded to the pulleys yet. Once you get that on, put the fan with the fan shroud down, start the fan clutch onto the water pump, and then use that special tool to tighten it down. And then we'll move on to the radiator, 
put the transmission cooler lines back on. You don't need a tool to put those on. You just press them in and then bolt the fan shroud down. Put any other hoses on the radiator that belong there, such as the upper radiator hose and the overflow. And then once you put those clamps on, we can put the plastic piece or the, the shroud that goes on top of the upper radiator support back on, clip it down, reinstall your spare tire tool, and then put the air intake back in, reattach the two hoses that go on. And once you press those in, you can tighten up the clamp that holds it onto the throttle body to make sure there are no air leaks, plug in any electrical connector, such as your temp sensor, your MAF sensor, and anything else that is on there put back the engine cover if you wish to do so, and fill up the cooling system. I highly recommend one of these funnels because it prevents any spillage. And now, let's start up the truck for the first time. So that is about all I had for you. The truck runs great. I've actually driven it. This is this is my truck, by the way. I've driven it almost a thousand miles since that repair, and it has not skipped a beat. So I can assure you that what you see in that video worked. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope this gave you more insight on what this project entails, what goes into it, it's a long project, it's not an easy job, but it is definitely doable. Now, if you have any other information, tips, tricks, anything you have pertaining to this video or to this job, leave it in the comment section below so that we can all share our knowledge and learn from one another. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, ring that bell so you can get all notifications for all of our future videos. And I'll see you in the next one.